teaching that supports the observance of the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 11, let me begin to read at verse 23, where we have the passages of Scripture which support the observance of communion. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. I want uh, to begin by commenting, by uh, referring to the fact that this apart from the way that history remembers it as the night of the Last Supper, this was the night in which he was betrayed. This was the act that triggered the, the trials and the crucifixion, which in turn triggered the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is actually the basis of our salvation. If uh, people were to ask, uh, you know, well, how do you know that you're saved? You have to be able to go all the way back and show how the Lord Jesus Christ was guiltless. And that's why the word betrayal is used here. Because since he was guiltless, he had no business being taken to trial. And uh, six illegal trials, and he had no business being crucified. And that is uh, the way in which we have uh, attained our salvation. So the first thing I want to comment on in verse 23 is that the Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed. His betrayal indicates that in his person he was perfect in every way. He was qualified to go to the cross and to bear your sins and mine. He was like the lamb that is without spot and without wrinkle. Verse 24 goes on to say, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In verse 24, you have the do this in remembrance of me clause. And this clause tells us that this is a command for the believer in Christ to observe this particular ritual. Do this in remembrance of me. The clause also indicates that the focus of the ritual, of the ritual is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not the liturgy itself. It is not the words of the preacher. It is not the song that is sung or the music that is played in the background. It, the focus is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that gives this particular ritual its rich content of solemnity. This is the time when you as a believer priest, when you as an individual need to clean off everything from your mind and just focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Obviously, the very first thing that you need to do is that you need to make sure that your sins are confessed so that you are able to make that live contact. Second thing that you need to do is that you need to tune up your memory center so that you're able to go through in your mind the various things that compose your salvation and how it is that the Lord Jesus Christ has been your Savior. So... He says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What um, is in reference here is that he broke the bread and that he gave a piece, or that he distributed the bread among those who sat around the table. This is indicative of the fact that each individual person must accept or must believe in Christ as his personal Savior. The Lord himself says, unless you eat of my flesh, you are nothing. You're, no, you're not anyone. You have to have eternal life, and that is by partaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you eat something, it becomes part of you. You wring it of all of its uh, nutritional value and everything, and it becomes part of you. Your energy, your personality, uh, your growth, everything. And so this is what salvation is to you. It changes every bit of your being because you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior. Verse 25 says that in the same way, he also took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Once again, you have the remembrance clause because this is supposed to be done by the believer in Christ. Notice that it says that in the same way. In other words, 
the same way that the bread is distributed, the cup is, dis is distributed. And the cup is representative of the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. It is in direct reference to what is known as the New Covenant. The New Covenant has five provisions in it, all of which are invisible. You can't see them, you can't taste them, you can't smell them, you can't hear them. They are spiritual in nature. And they are indicated by the little bubbles in the edge of your cup when you're drinking that, that juice or that wine or whatever it is that you're drinking. If it weren't for the bubble, you wouldn't know that it was there. But there is a little bit of gas that's in there, and those represent the spiritual benefits that the Lord has procured for you on the cross. There's the forgiveness of sins, there's the ministry of the Holy Spirit, there is a new heart, a new mind, and a new nature, all of which are yours. These are yours because of what Christ did on the cross. So today, I'm going to ask the gentleman to bring the elements out and distribute them to you. And uh, we'll begin with the bread, and then we'll go to the cup. And I would like for you to remember that the bread represents the person of Christ. The cup represents the work of Christ. And so, gentlemen, if you would uh, distribute the elements, please. <coughs> And we will wait for each other so that we can all partake together. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you should have both of the things that are symbolized or emblemized by these elements. You should have the bread, which represents the purity of the character of our Lord Jesus Christ, the theanthropic person. He is the person in hypostatic union who was qualified to go to the cross and to pay the penalty for all of our sins. That is what the bread signifies. There's a further indication that when you put the bread into your mouth, it's your teeth that crush it. And the Bible says that it pleased God the Father to crush him. And that is what we do when we partake of this particular element. So, shall we partake of the bread together? And shall we pray? Father, we're thankful for the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful that He was the one who stepped up and paid the penalty for our sins. We thank You for that in Christ's name. Amen. Now the cup represents the work that the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. Shall we partake of the cup together? shall we pray our heavenly father we're reminded of the words in scripture that says that for by grace are we saved we thank you lord that when we think of the grace that has saved us we see that we have been taken from the depths the darkest depths of sin and you have given us new life in christ we are thankful that we have a position that we enjoy that we share with the lord jesus christ we thank you for the righteousness. We thank you for his justice. We thank you, Father, for the fact that we are included to be in Christ. We thank you for all of these things now. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, having... Um,
having gone through that, uh, let's uh, catch up our where we left off. We have looked at Gehazi being the servant of Elisha. We've seen Gehazi's insubordination. We've seen Gehazi's desire for material things. We've seen his life after leprosy. And now we want to take a look at the principle of doctrine that's called ministerial succession. Ministerial succession. Principle number one is that you can be replaced. The first instance that the Bible brings to our attention is the principle that is seen in Moses and, and Joshua. <clears throat> Under Moses and Joshua we find, uh, first of all, that there is the regular protocol of how to pass the baton from one person to the next, or from one generation to the next. Passages of Scripture, um, Numbers, uh, chapter 11, chapter 14, chapter 27, Deuteronomy 31, and uh, verse 14, verse 33, and then Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. This is the usual way in which the baton is to be passed from one minister to the next. However, in the life of Moses and Joshua, we find that because Moses did not obey the Lord that was due his disobedience was actually due to unbelief and this is probably one of the most difficult things for Christians to understand that is that the problems that you have they're not psychological the problems that you have are not intellectual the problems that you have are faith based they are because you do not believe they are theological that you do not believe what God is and what God is can do what it is that he stands for. Numbers chapter 20 verses 1 through 12 we read the story about how Moses struck the rock rather than speak to the rock. As a result he was denied the privilege of taking the people across the Jordan River into the promised land. Next instance that we have is the story of Aaron and Eliezer. Well, we uh, just read in, Do in Numbers chapter 20 that Moses and Aaron were both supposed to stand in front of the, of the rock, gather the congregation together, and apparently Aaron was uh, very peeved at the people, just like Moses was. And so when Moses struck the rock, it was like uh, Aaron was saying, Amen, brother, you preach it, you keep it up, and uh, you know I'll back you up on this. And so we find that Aaron is going to be replaced because of his unbelief. So if your Bibles are still open to Numbers chapter 20, and if not, then please turn to Numbers 20. We will take a look at verse 12 once again, and then we'll jump over to verse 23. Verse 12 says, But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, notice both of them are addressed here, because you have not believed me, the disobedience is actually a theological issue. It is one, a lack of faith. You have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. I could say an awful lot more about that second uh, uh, phrase that I just read here, to treat me um, as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. It is the minister's job to represent God and His holiness. And so, for instance, we all like to joke, and we like to tell jokes from the pulpit, but if I start saying something like, you know, it's time that you look at the man upstairs, you know, that old man upstairs, and talk to him face to face. Well, now I'm not treating him as holy. I'm demeaning him. I'm just saying, he, you know, he's the man upstairs. He's not the man upstairs. He is a holy man. God. And the Bible says that it is a fearsome thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. And so this is what Moses and Aaron didn't do. They did not treat that rock as holy. And they did it in front of the congregation. And basically it's like slapping Jesus Christ in the face. So guess what? Aaron doesn't get to go into the promised land. Now let me ask you if you can go back into your memories from Sunday school. How many people of the original generation that came out of Egypt went into the promised land? There was two. 
if I remember correctly, you know who they were? It was Joshua and some other guy by the name of what? Caleb or something? Well, what about the two top dogs? I mean, Moses was an alpha male, wasn't he? And what about Aaron? He was a priest, but he didn't get to go either. And so, in this verse, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you, plural, shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. And so in these verses, we are able to see a sentence that is pronounced on these two men of leadership. Jump down to verse 23 now. The death of Aaron. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron at Mount Hor by the border of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron will be gathered to his people, for he shall not enter the land which I have given to the sons of Israel, because you rebelled against my commandment at the waters of Meribah. Take Aaron and his son Eliezer, bring them up to Mount Hor, and strip Aaron of his garments and put them on his son Eleazar. So what you have here is just like in the military. The man is going to be stripped of his rank. All of his patches are going to be cut off and they are going to be passed on to his son Eleazar. What's happened? Replacement. It's replacement because of unbelief. Now, there's a, an incident that is mentioned there. We won't go into it so as to save time. Next we have the incident of Elijah and Elisha. And we talked about that. It was going to be Elijah passes the baton on to Elisha who is going to pass it on to Gehazi. But it didn't work that way. Elijah passed the baton on to Elisha. Elisha would have passed it on to Gehazi but Gehazi took his eyes off the Lord and put him on material things and he ended up working for a secular job working as a consultant to the king. Alright, letter D, the twelve. Who are the twelve? Those are the twelve who turn out to be the apostles. There's a man by the name of Matthias, or Mattathias, depending as to how you spell it. And uh, he was chosen to replace Judah, uh, Judas as the twelfth apostle in Acts chapter 1. Okay, remember the Lord selected twelve. One of them was the one who betrayed the Lord. And uh, after he realized what he had done, he tried to repent, he tried to do all of the things, and it just wasn't working, he committed suicide. And so the 11 who survived, the 11 who remained, they said, hey, we got to do something, we have to fill the office. And so they even quote a passage of, from the Old Testament, and said, hey, we need to fill the office. And so they selected a person who was very qualified, who was a very fine man, he, but it wasn't, well, let me just say that this is what is known as an example of apostolic succession. In other words, one apostle passes the baton to somebody else. Let me see if I can further illustrate this. While, Math, while Matthias did indeed succeed Judas as one of the twelve, this was because he was elected. He was elected by a committee of the eleven. Unfortunately, God doesn't work through committees. He does his own appointing. And he didn't want Matthias to be one of the twelve. He wanted somebody by the name of Saul of Tarsus to be one of the twelve. So this is in no sense an argument for continuing apostolic succession since Matthias was not selected by Christ. Matthias being chosen to replace Judas is only an argument for the church replacing ungodly and unfaithful leaders such as Judas with godly and faithful leaders such as Matthias. And that is the only corollary that you can draw from that particular event. And that is that it's right to replace somebody who is unworthy of the job with somebody who is worthy of the job. Number five, nowhere in the New Testament are 
any of the twelve apostles recorded as passing on their apostolic authority to successors. Now let me repeat this. None of the twelve, none of them, are recorded in the scriptures of saying, okay, since I'm going to pass off the scene, I'm going to pass my baton on to you and you're going to be the next apostle. Nowhere do any of the apostles predict that they will pass on their apostolic authority. And it's important for us to see that right from the outset, that the Bible does not ever give that as documentary evidence. Jesus ordained the apostles. Jesus ordained the apostles to build the foundation of the church. This is Ephesians 2.20. So what is the foundation that the apostles built? Well, that foundation is called the New Testament. It's the record of the deeds and the teachings of the apostles. Another name for that is the mind of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, but the foundation of the church is the New Testament. This is the record of the deeds and the teachings of the apostles. Letter C the church does not need apostolic successors. The church does not need apostolic successors. Letter D. The church needs the teaching of the apostles accurately recorded and preserved. Let's face it. If you're going to get good, accurate Bible teaching, you're not going to get it at a seminary. You're not going to get it at some type of a seminar. You're not going to get it at the Disneyland type churches. The only place that you're going to get good Bible teaching is in a church that is dedicated to teaching the Bible and nothing else. And that's what we're about here. We want to make the Bible as clear as possible so that you as an individual can see. This is what the Bible says. It should have the ring to you as thus saith the Lord. Letter E. That is exactly what God has provided in His Word. Now I've given you three passages of Scripture and you can write them down, look them up later. Ephesians 1.13, Colossians 1.5, and 2 Timothy 2.15 as well as chapter 4 and verse 2. <clears throat> the issue of succession and biblical interpretation. The Roman Catholic Church claims that a lack of ongoing apostolic authority results in doctrinal confusion and chaos. In other words, they say, you know why you Protestants have so many denominations? Because you don't have a Pope. If you had a Pope, then everybody would toe the line and follow the Pope and kiss the Pope's toe, which is tradition. And so they say, because you don't have a Pope, that's why you have so many different denominations. And everybody's got a different interpretation of the Bible. Well, do you get baptized with a sprinkling of water? Do you get dunked in the water? Uh, how do you get baptized anyway? Do you get baptized in the name of Jesus? Do you get baptized in the name of the Trinity? Who do you get baptized by? By the way, you know that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Are you sure you're Christians? Are you Trinitarians or are you Twinitarians? We believe in God the Father and God the Son, but we don't believe in God the Holy Spirit. Have you ever met people like that? I have. Letter B. It is an unfortunate truth that the apostles acknowledged that false teachers would arise. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Admittedly, the lack of supreme authority among non-Catholic churches results in many different interpretations of the Bible. Can't deny the facts. Letter C. However, these differences in interpretation are not the result of Scripture being unclear. Rather, they are the result of even non-Catholic Christians carrying on the Catholic tradition of interpreting Scripture and according to their own traditions. So there are some people who say, this is what God is telling me out of John 3.16. God didn't really have a son. He had a confused gender offspring. And that is my interpretation. It may not be right for you, but it's right for me. See? 
And so you have confusion because people want to interpret the Bible according to their own desires and their own uh, measuring stick. Letter D. If scripture is studied in its entirety and in its proper context, the truth can be easily determined. That's what we do here. We call it ice teaching, isagogics, categories, and exegesis. Doctrinal differences and, and denominational conflicts are a result of some Christians refusing to agree with what the scripture says, not as a result of there being no supreme authority to interpret scripture. Letter E. In short, apostolic succession is not biblical. Sub point one. The concept of apostolic succession is never found in scripture. Check. Number two. What is found in scripture is that the true church will teach what the scriptures teach and will compare all doctrines and practices to scripture in order to determine what is true and right. Letter F. Alignment with scriptural teaching, not apostolic succession, is the determining factor of the trueness of a church. So how do you know what's a true church and what's a full, false church? Well, it's the alignment with scriptural teaching, not the alignment with some religious guy that wears fancy robes. What is mentioned in scripture is the idea that the word of God was to be the guide that the church was to follow. We find this in Acts chapter 20, verse 32. We'll look it up at this point. It is scripture that was to be infallible, that is the infallible measuring stick for doctrine and practice. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Let me repeat this point because this is a very important one. It is scripture that was to be the infallible measuring stick for doctrine and practice. It's not science and health with key to the scriptures. It's not the New World Translation. Or it's not some book that somebody wrote that's apart from the scriptures. It is the scriptures that doctrines are to be compared with. Acts 17. So you need to, when you have a doctrine, you need to compare it with the scriptures to see whether it matches everything else in the Bible. Number four, apostolic authority was passed on through the writings of the apostles, not through apostolic succession. So the authority of God's word was passed on because the next preacher would say, this is what the scriptures say. We have the genuine, authentic text of scripture. Here it is. Roman numeral number four. The Archbishop of Rome. The Archbishop of Rome. The doctrine of apostolic succession is the belief that the twelve apostles passed on their authority to successors who then pass the apostolic authority on to their successors, continuing throughout the centuries, even unto today, that is, unto this date. Letter B. The Roman Catholic Church sees Peter as the leader of the apostles with the greatest authority, and therefore his successors carry on the greatest authority. Okay. Now this is where you get a little bit of that mixture of truth and falsity. All right, Jesus had three top disciples. Let's just call them top disciples for now. They were Peter, James, and John. Well, there he is, Peter. He's included in every one of those private circles. So he must have been the boss man. But the scripture never says that. And the scripture doesn't teach that. Number one. The Roman Catholic Church combines this belief with the concept that Peter later became the first pastor or the first bishop of Rome and that the Roman pastors, that is bishops after him, were accepted by the early church as the central authority among all the churches because the church at Rome turned out to be the biggest, had the biggest uh, budget uh, and there were a couple of other things that entered into it it was accepted by the people back then and by his smaller churches that the church in Rome was the one that had more authority than they did. 
we see this today. Somebody will say, well, how come you have this matchbox church and those guys over there have got roller coasters in their lobby for crying out loud? You know, God must be blessing them. How come he's not blessing you? See, well, that's what they were doing back then. They didn't have roller coasters, but they did have a lot of regalia, which they still sport today. Apostolic succession combined with Peter's supremacy among the apostle results in the Roman pastor or the bishop being the supreme authority of the Catholic Church. We call him the Pope. Let her see. However, nowhere in Scripture did Jesus, the apostles, or any other New Testament writer set forth the idea of apostolic succession. Further, neither is Peter presented as supreme over the other apostles. The apostle Paul, in fact, rebukes Peter when Peter was leading others astray. Write this passage down if you don't write anything else. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. Because here's Peter, who's supposed to be the top dog of the bunch. And here comes a Johnny come lady, Paul, and he rebukes him to his face. He says, hey, you're not acting consistent with what the doctrine teaches. And that is that once you're a believer in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, we are all in Christ. So get off your high horse, Peter. Sit with the rest of us. We will have pork, pulled pork, barbecued pork, all kinds of pork. We'll have shrimp, you know, all kinds of shrimp. Because we are all in Christ. Yes, the Apostle Peter had a prominent role. That's true. Yes, perhaps the Apostle Peter was the leader of the Apostles. Although the book of Acts records that the Apostle Paul and Jesus as brother James as also having prominent leadership roles. So, just because he's mentioned as having leadership role doesn't mean that he was the sole and only leader in the church. Point number three. Whatever the case, Peter was not the commander or supreme authority over the other apostles. Number four. Even if apostolic succession could be demonstrated from Scripture, which it cannot, apostolic succession would not result in Peter's successors being absolutely supreme over the other apostles' successors. And so this is a controversy that is existing in the Roman Catholic Church today. What are we going to do with that Archbishop of Canterbury? We need to bring him under the fold. We need to fold him under our wings. What about, you know, that the Greek Orthodox Church? I mean, they're Greeks, all right, you know, but what are we going to do with them? And they're saying, well, we have to have this ecumenical thing to bring them all in. But we are still going to remain on top. Letter D. And I'm quoting here from a thing that's called the Lumen Gentium. This is section 20 and subsection 2. The bishops have the divine institution taken the place of the apostles as pastors of the church in such wise that whoever listens to them is listening to Christ and whoever despises them despises Christ and him who sent Christ. Lumen Gentium 22. What is Lumen Gentium? Well, it's Latin for the light of the nations. It's the dogmatic constitution of the church. It is one of the principal documents of the Second Vatican Council. This dogmatic constitution was promulgated by Pope Paul VI on 21 November 1964 following approval by the assembled bishops by a vote of 2,151 to 5. This is 1964. That's just a little over 50 years ago. And I want you to notice how they are still pushing this idea forward. I have a list of various councils of the Catholic Church. 
And um, I'm just going to put them up here just so you get an idea of what it's like. Council of Florence was in 1439. That's when the seven sacraments were passed. In other words, if you don't collect all seven rings at the end of the merry-go-round, you will not go to heaven. You need to have all seven sacraments or you won't get there. Council of Trent, 1545. The Vulgate Apocrypha was accepted. That is, the 14 books that are not in the uh, Protestant Bible were accepted as being holy writings. That was 1545. And also, tradition is inspired. What is tradition? Well, tradition is, for instance, something that a famous pastor said, and now that has the same weight as what the Bible says. Now, there are a lot of things that can be said for that. But the import of that is that if you belong to the Catholic Church and the priest says to you, you must say 20 Hail Marys, you better say them because that is the word of God for you. You see. <clears throat> and Thomas Aquinas' theology was uh, accepted as the official theology of the Roman Catholic Church. The Immaculate Conception came up in 1854. And this is when not only Jesus was born of a virgin, but so was the Virgin Mary. Whoa, how did that happen? Hey, it's in the genes, right? Okay. Vatican Council number one started in 1864 and ended in 1870, and that's when papal infallibility became law or dogma in the Roman Catholic Church. That means that whatever the Pope says, and he prefaces that with the words ex cathedra, that is law. That is the Word of God. Write it down because that's what it is. 1870. The Assumption of Mary in 1950 by papal decree. The Assumption of Mary. What is that? Well, that means... Well, it means that we really don't know what it means. Because Mary was the mother of Jesus... And so, according to, to tradition, she retired in Ephesus with John, right? Because John took her you know, from the site of the cross and he, uh, uh, he was uh, her supporter and everything else. And when John went to Ephesus, he took the mother of Jesus with him. But nobody knows whether she died or whether the Lord took her. And so this is called the Assumption of Mary. And so they're saying, we don't care whether she died or not. Well, all we want to say is that the Lord took her and took her to heaven because she was a special person. That was done in 1950 by a papal decree. Now, he couldn't have made that papal decree if papal infallibility hadn't been done in, 18, in 1870. But by 1950, he had the power to do that, and he did that. Vatican Council number two. That's 1962 to 1965, and that's where the whole ecumenicalism movement has begun, and that is where um, it is going. Okay. Historicity of leadership. First we have Christ. First historical, first historical uh, figure in our study. Christ was the Son of God, or the second person of the Trinity. That's who he was. But he had a church age title because he has a sub, a, another job. He is called the head of the church and he's called the great shepherd of the sheep. Since uh, he's the great shepherd of the sheep, that means that there are under shepherds and under shepherds are now pastors. An under shepherd is a pastor of a flock and this is where we get the historical support for one pastor and one church. Number two, we have Peter. Uh, that's who we were talking about to begin with. Well, Peter was the head of the church in Jerusalem, but before him there was one of the Jameses, who was one of the twelve. He was immediately martyred, or almost immediately. And so Jesus' half-brother, whose name was also James, became the next pastor, the next pastor of Jerusalem. And Peter was over him. Why was he over him? Peter is an apostle. The half-brother of Jesus was not. 
So here you have apostolic authority over one who isn't. He also had apostolic authority over Mark. Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark, which other which scholars called the Gospel of Peter because it's Peter's thoughts and Mark was an amanuensis. He just wrote, took down what Peter told him. Next comes Paul. Paul had two people who were under him of great uh, stature. The first was Titus. Paul sent him to the island of, of Cyprus as his apostolic deputy. <clears throat> Titus was there to appoint uh, pastors to the various churches on the island and to set the record straight as to what the correct doctrine should be. Titus 1.5 second person was a guy by the name of Timothy. Timothy was acting as his temporary representative uh, in the city of Ephesus, as he had done in the city of Corinth, and as he had done also in the church at Thessalonica and in Philippi. A couple passages of scripture there for you to chew on. His relation was not closer to one church than to any other churches of the province. And this is just a quote from one of the historians by the name of Zahn. I won't trouble you with that. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that Timothy was not a pastor, but he was under the authority of a pastor doing apostolic work. Paul, while in prison, summons Timothy to come. He says, give uh, diligence to come to, unto me. Uh, 2 Timothy 4.9, the fact that at this time when no Christian friend was with Paul, with the exception of Luke, was to Timothy, and he turned for sympathy, and he said, uh, closing with the request that his own son in the faith should come and be with him in his last hours. And John, the last of the apostles. There's, first of all, let me just say that there's a period of the martyrs, and that's from the year 100 to 325 A.D., a quote from Philip Schaff. Philip Schaff is probably the lead historian when it comes to the history of the church. We now descend from the primitive apostolic church to the Greco-Roman church. We descend from inspirations of the apostles and prophets to the productions of enlightened but fallible teachers. There is no other transition in history so radical and sudden and yet so silent and secret. It, the age of persecution, furnished a continuous commentary on the Savior's word, quote, Behold, I send you forth as sheep into the midst of wolves. Matthew 10, 16, 34. No merely human religion could have stood such an ordeal of fire for 300 years. So let me put a timeline here. Here's a timeline. On the left you have early, on the right you have late. So you have A.D. 33 to 100, the apostolic period. We start at age 33 because, or at, at uh, year 33 because that's when Christ was put on the cross at age 33. So from 33 to 100, that's called the apostolic period. From year 100 to 325, it's called the period of the martyrs. <clears throat> the Apostle John represents the, apost the Apostolic period and Papias and Ignatius the period of the martyrs. John was taught by the Lord Jesus. John died in 100 AD and he taught a fellow by the name of Polycarp. Polycarp died at the stake at age 155 and he taught two fellows, one by the name of Papias and the other one by the name of Ignatius. Once again, here's our timeline. So you have the apostolic period. John was the last apostle. You have an incomplete canon of scripture. The next period that I called your attention to was the period of the martyrs. And that's where you have Papias and Ignatius. And now you have fallible pastors. In the middle, you have a bridge period in which Polycarp functioned as a minister. And he had a completed canon of scripture. And so you have the, the baton being passed from one season to the next to the next, and there was no pope involved. Polycarp, who was born in 69 AD, became the pastor of Smyrna. He died in 155 AD. He has this quote, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he hath done me no wrong. How can I speak evil of my king and who saved me? Ignatius. 
He was a pastor teacher at Antioch of Syria, which, I mean, you should automatically remember, oh, that's where the Apostle Paul went to church, so he became a pastor there. Wow! His desire for death. In other words, how did he want to die? This is what he says. I should rather die for Christ than rule the whole earth. It is glorious to go down in the world in order to go up to God. Leave me to beast. And so he was thrown to wild beasts in the Colosseum at Rome. Okay, I've got one more slide to show you here. <clears throat> These are the lyrics by Oscar Bernadotte in 1888. These words are, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. We were going to sing it today, but I forgot that we have the union coming in, so we won't have time. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses and lands. Yes, I'd rather be led by His nail-pierced hands than to be a king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. The name of this writer is Oscar Bernadotte. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Although American hymnals show that Rhea Miller as the author of the song, Swedish sources attribute the original to Prince Oscar. In 1888, he relinquished his royal title and right to succession in order to marry a commoner who had influenced his religious beliefs. I believe that she led him to Christ. Afterwards, he was active in Christian service, and that started the Swedish revival. All right, let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we're thankful for your goodness to us. We're thankful that you have provided such a great word for us to be able to follow. We thank you for all of this. In Christ's name, amen. We are dismissed.